Job chapter 1 verse 1 gives us a portrait of one of the great men of all time sketched by God. In Job's private life, he was mature, towards others upright, as to God reverent, regarding evil separate. Those who worship at the shrine of achievement do well to learn at Job's footstool. He lost all those things the world worships, business, children, health, his wife's affection, and finally the respect of his friends. Yet he never lost the source of all true blessing, God himself. The book opens to us the true contest of life, a cosmic struggle for the souls of men. Job was the object of heaven's interest. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He was also the target of satanic attack. Satan would respond, have you not made a hedge around him? How did Satan know? Because he had tried to break through it. The book can be divided into three. Job in the hands of Satan, in the hands of men, and in the hands of God. Job was an actual person. There was a man, we read, and both Ezekiel and James treat him as such. The events are historical as well. There was a day. Job appears to have lived after the flood since it's mentioned in Job 22 as having occurred. But we assume that Job lived before Israel was formed because it isn't mentioned. He may have been contemporary with Abram. That's key because it means Job is more than likely the first book in the Bible. God doesn't hide from the problem of suffering. He addresses it head on. This book doesn't intend to answer the question, why do good people suffer? Because that's often a mystery. But one thing we do know, God is there with Job in his troubles, revealing himself to Job as the all-creating, all-sustaining, all-knowing one. Campbell Morgan, in his book, The Answers of Jesus to Job, writes, I like Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar for three reasons. I like them first because they came to see him when he was in the dark, when the other crowd of acquaintance had all gone. Then I like them because when they came into his presence, they sat still and shut their mouths for seven days. That's a great proof of friendship, the ability to say nothing. And yet again, when they did speak, I liked them because they said everything they had to say to him and not to other people about him." End quote. Despite their differences, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar all agreed on one thing. Job was a hypocrite. He must be deserving, otherwise, according to them, God would be unjust. They spoke about God, but never spoke to him. But once Job had answered each accusation, his heart gravitated to God in prayer. And though he was enduring excruciating agony, he knew that his friends had erred. Yet Job's replies were only viewed as self-indication. Perhaps one reason the book of Job is there is to prove that even righteous men like Job can't make it without the Lord. Eliphaz, a spiritualist, had confidence in human experience. In chapter 4, he related a ghost story to convince his hearers that he was in touch with the real world. Eliphaz said many true and eloquent things, but in the end, he remained hard and cruel. Bildad, a traditionalist, thought history held the key. In Job 8, he called on Job to inquire about the former age. Zophar was the legalist. His religious dogmatism assumed to know what God would do in every case. The most shallow and the least appealing, he was the first one silenced. The Lord raises many questions which he doesn't answer. But many of them begin with who? Who designed and controls the universe, Job? That answer should be obvious. God does. And he is enough. He isn't obliged to explain everything, but he does give to the trusting but anguished spirit such a sense that he's in control that our questioning ends in peaceful submission. In time, he'll make it plain. And that's our scripture snapshot of the book of Job.